And what I'll do is I'll kind of set the stage uh, in terms of talking about how to develop not only soft skills, but also occupational skills in relationship to leadership, and in this case, compassionate leadership. So I'm gonna go ahead and start the presentation. And again, anytime you have any questions, let me know. So let me give you a tiny bit of backdrop on who I am, uh, because it relates very much to some of the concepts that you guys are really interested in. Uh, my name is Dan Martin. You can call me Dan, <laughs> which is fine. Don't worry about professor or any of that stuff, uh, because I'm on sabbatical, you know? See, I don't need to shake. <laughs> Life is good. Um, the reality of the situ situation is that um, my expertise originally was not compassion. Compassion came much further along the line. Uh, when I was a high school student, you guys are in high school? Okay, cool. No? No, sir. Middle school? Okay, awesome. Um, so here's the thing. When I was in high school, I wasn't in high school. Why? You dropped out? I did. Actually, I don't have a high school diploma. So it's just evidence that you guys can drop out now and be not successful like me. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the thing. Um, I dropped out, uh, but I went to community college, and I ended up going to college. And I was really interested in the turbulence of American society and society in general. So my original expertise was in hierarchy enhancing behavior. What does that mean? Sexism, racism, prejudice, discrimination, the kinds of things that we all experience on a daily basis, no matter where we are in the world, in terms of caste systems or in terms of other debilitating problems in terms of society. Okay, so when I see educational inequality, it strikes a chord in me because I see it live on a daily basis because of course I teach for a great school. As a matter of fact, it's the world's best school in Hayward, California, Cal State East Bay. It's the only university there. So <laughs> it's easy for me to say that. How did I become involved in compassion? Well, uh, after many years of being a complete sellout, uh, I'm a social psychologist by training, but I was a smart social psychologist and I did my PhD also in industrial organizational psychology, which enabled me to get a job in a business school, and that's where I met Tatiana. But um, business is really interesting in the sense that it's usually based on ideology, right? What's the most important thing in the world? Ideology. Well, that's a great answer. <laughs> but if you're from a capitalistic society, you're probably going to say money, money, cheddar, cash, dinero, skrilla, right? Bacon. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so the bottom line is, as a business professor, I've always been studying things that make people feel really uncomfortable. As a matter of fact, if you ever come into one of my parties, you'll say, "Hey, what do you do for a living?" And I never tell people because inevitably I hurt. I hurt people's feelings. Um, so I always just say I'm a garbage man. It makes life a lot easier. They're like, oh, oh, thanks so much, man. Really appreciate your work. I'm like, cool, thank you. <laughs> so uh, when I got tenure, meaning I could stay with the university for about as long as I wanted to and study whatever I wanted to study, I thought that, hey, I'm tired of studying why women don't get jobs uh, equitably, why minorities don't get jobs equitably, why there's discrimination in things like training, compensation, selection, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I thought I'd move towards positive psychology because I'm a psychologist and this is something that is really interesting to me. Well, the cool thing about positive psychology is that it's highly applicable everywhere. The bad thing about it is it's completely Pollyanna-ish. Pollyanna-ish. Anybody from Russia here? Okay, why am I saying Pollyanna-ish? What does that mean? Uh, it's actually a <laughs> reference to a very famous Russian author who had a character in one of his stories called Pollyanna, I'm believing this is true, and she just saw the world as perfect and rose-hued and wonderful. Wouldn't it be nice if the world was totally awesome and just yeah. delightful? Awesome. It would be, but that's when we have rose-colored glasses on. We're not paying attention to the full complexity of reality. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? We can be happy people and still go, wow, that's a bad situation, we should address it. We can be you know, happy to help people in many ways, but if we're not really addressing the underlying problems, we're gonna have significant problems. So, um, I was invited by the medical school at Stanford to actually become a visiting faculty member. I thought this was pretty cool because frankly, I would have done anything to get Stanford on my resume. <laughs> I would have gone to any department there, including the janitorial department. <laughs> so when they said, yeah, it's all about compassion, I was all, Give me a break. 
Do you understand the world you're living in? Do you understand the complexity and problems that people suffer on a day-to-day -day basis? Or are you just in this, you know, ivory tower doing ridiculous things with lots of money? Yeah, yeah they are. You're right. <laughs> but they're also doing good things as well. <laughs> so I was like, sure, I'll take the job. Uh, but at the same time, I started, of course, looking at the data because I'm a data-driven person, not an ideology-driven person. Does that make sense? I go where the truth, as we define it, shows me. Does that make sense? So as I learned more about compassion, I started realizing, wow, this is something that's really important and missing from so many of our lives. And as I became to understand uh, a lot more about compassion, I started realizing that, you know, this is at the core of most of our great philosophical traditions, most of our great religious traditions, and how we're able to build trust and convey things like confidence as well as benefits to humanity across the board. So what is compassion? Why should we focus on this? Well, I'll just give you guys a really simple kind of approach to understand compassion. Um, before I do, we know that this is good at the macro level, at the meso level, and at the micro level. So it's good for your body. How many of you have ever felt stressed out? Finals. I say, yeah, of course, and you understand what stress is all about. Um, does that have an impact on your physiology? Oh, yeah. Does sure. that have an impact on your mental well-being? Yes. Right. Okay. So compassion is really good for both of those things. We also understand that it's good for a host of other benefits that involve things like ideology, meaning how many of you have ever gone to a doctor? That's a ridiculous question. Of course not. <laughs> Okay, so medical doctors are under a lot of pressure these days. Why are they under a lot of pressure? They're under a lot of pressure because they need to push clients through their doors very fast. They get paid more the more patients they see on a daily basis, right? So the interesting thing is, is doctors who are not perceived as being compassionate take a lot longer with their clientele. Now this sounds kind of counterintuitive, right? Well, the reason why is because doctors who are perceived as being compassionate address the real issue with their patient, which is, I care about you. Okay, having cancer is having cancer. It's going to be the same either way. But when you know that your doctor cares about you, you're not gonna be bombarding them with questions until you feel they actually care about you. You'll feel it the first time. I'm not suggesting that people should do this to increase their bottom line, but the interesting thing is it does facilitate that anyways. It also prevents malpractice lawsuits and a host of other things. Thinking about becoming a medical doctor, anybody? Smart move. <laughs> uh, insurance is terrible. <laughs> anyway, we'll talk about that later. So this is an important part of the world, but we don't see it. And when we see it, it's really a weak kind of approach. Uh, an approach that involves Hallmark cards, or maybe balloons, or maybe, you know, hugs. Um, I'm going to introduce you to compassion in a slightly different way, which could be a little bit scary. Don't be scared. We'll be silly about it and dive into it. So what really is compassion? We'll take three elements. Yes, that's my daughter going down. You guys know where this is? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's right near. Is it near, built? Yeah, exactly. It's right near uh, the mm. Bay Bridge. And this is a very okay. famous sculpture oh. of a bow mm -hmm. yeah. and an arrow. Rogue, yeah. And it's exceptionally ugly. But it says <laughs> right underneath there, do not slide down. So I'm trying to be compassionate and let my daughter have a little fun while she's breaking the law. Anyway, that's another story. So the first component is something that you're probably familiar with when we talk about compassion. The first component is being aware of another suffering. How many of us are aware of suffering? I think all of us are, and the reason why is because from an evolutionary perspective, it's hardwired. Uh, if you ever walk with a little kid through San Francisco, what's the first thing that happens to you? They grab your hand and they look at the homeless person that's probably near AT&T Park where they sell fries for $8, and they say, can you give this person, can you give this person something, can you help this person? It's only after we become a little bit older that we put blinders on and we say, I can't focus on that. Does this sound familiar to you? Mm -hmm. Do we all do this on a daily basis? When we're watching television or YouTube late at night and there's one of those ads about refugees, do we quickly turn the channel, 
kind of challenge us to be active in the 1980s. Uh, <laughs> do we quickly go to another website? <laughs> because we can't take the pain. It hurts so much. So being aware of another suffering is the first component of an action-oriented definition of compassion. Notice awareness of one's own suffering. How many of us just put away our own suffering on a daily basis? Yeah, I think most of us do. We would not be standing here right now or sitting here uh, if it wasn't for our own desire to be really strong and ambitious. Would you agree? Yeah. It's a Sunday afternoon. You guys are doing amazing things being here. But the reality of the situation is, is we don't pay attention to ourselves. And what ends up happening? Do we grind ourselves down on occasion? So we'll talk about that. So this is really the first component. You might think of this as mindfulness. Is mindfulness really important? Yeah. Have you guys been bombarded by SEL, socio-emotional uh, learning? So mindfulness is completely awesome, and this is why we teach our military snipers how to be mindful, because they can kill with that much more efficiency if they're not being bothered by anything else. <laughs> so the reality of the situation is, is if you give mindfulness skills to a psychotic person who doesn't care about humanity, they'll just be able to pull people apart that much more efficiently. So let's not kid ourselves and say we actually need to put all these things in context. So again, I'm going to invite you to challenge some of these standard fair types of approaches because something's popular, people talk about it, and everybody buys it. But we need to dive in, and we'll do that today. So this is the first part of our definition. The second part is another thing that you hear about quite frequently as well, empathy having an emotional response to another person's pain or your pain. So how many of you have seen somebody and felt empathetic? You sympathize with their plight. You say, oh, you know, that could be me, or I've been there before, right? Okay, empathy is critical, and I have a lot of colleagues who study empathy. I have so much respect for these folks, but the reality of the situation is, is if we wallow in the world's suffering, what happens to us? We suffer as well. So having empathy really is not enough. Just noticing another person's suffering going, wow, I feel horrible now too, <laughs> isn't really going to cut it when we talk about behavioral action. That leads us to the third part, which of course is doing something about it. And that's what you are all doing here uh, today on this lovely Sunday afternoon. And the reality of the situation is, is people think of compassion as being a very weak kind of approach to reality, when in fact it takes an enormous amount of strength to be able to move towards suffering. And that's exactly what compassion is. It's moving towards suffering to ameliorate it, to address suffering. We don't do that. We see a little bit of blood, eee, we run. We see somebody suffering, we say, sucker, <laughs> good luck, I'm going to take your place in line, right? Um, and the reality of the situation is, is when we take it from this perspective, moving towards another person suffering, it doesn't matter if it's somebody who maybe needs help on the street after they've fallen down, or maybe it's a colleague at work who needs assistance, or for example, somebody who's studying for that uh, AP math class and they're struggling. Can we help them? Well, in fact, we can, and that's exactly what it is. We need to take into consideration wisdom here, though, because how many times have we thought that we were helping somebody when in fact we were just hurting them? That's right. Yeah, so we need to help people based on what their needs are, not what right. our needs are. Yeah. And I've been blessed to be able to teach people in cross-cultural psychology. I've had many different uh, students, graduate students in clinical psychology, whose hearts are so tremendously huge that they want to force their ways of help down people's throats who don't need that kind of help. I'm kind of framing this, but how do we really start to understand what this looks like in reality. Well, let's take a couple different perspectives on this. So when we think about this, let's give you a little bit of a backdrop in terms of the neuropsychology of emotions. Mm -hmm. Let's not even bother calling it the neuropsychology of emotions because that just sounds like a mouthful. Um, I have a colleague, a brilliant clinical psychologist from England by the name of Dr. Paul Gilbert. Paul has actually been knighted uh, because of his contributions to the well-being of the English population. Um, and Paul was really kind of instrumental in cognitive behavioral therapy in the sense that cognitive behavioral therapy is probably one of the most efficient and effective way of helping people deal with mental health and well-being issues. Um, the thing is, is 
it's okay to know you have a problem. How many of we of us know we have a problem? Yeah, I mean, you know you have a problem, and how many of you know you need to do something about it? <laughs> That's all of us, right? <laughs> uh, and how many of you struggle with it because you're ashamed or guilty yeah. or feel like you're not strong enough, and there's these emotions that yeah, get in their sure. way? So the interesting thing is the intellectual model that we have is essentially based on cognition, when in fact there's this huge emotional component to everything that we do. And there's a good reason for this, because our emotions teach us and they tell us important things. Mm -hmm. I did not know this. <laughs> I knew it intrinsically, but I wasn't trained it that way. So this is really important. Let's talk about three systems. First, there's the drive system, there's the threat system, and this is what we know best. The one system that we never talk about is the soothing system. Mm. So let's walk you through these systems very briefly. And I'll just stay here for a while and talk about them. Um, is anybody wearing Nikes right now? All right, awesome. What's the Nike tagline? Uh, just do it, Nike. Yeah, exactly. It's just do it, okay? So when we think about the drive system, in essence, what it's telling us is, hey, achieve. Go for your goals. Be ambitious. Tackle those things that you want to tackle. And we all feel these things. We all think, yeah, when I grow up, I'm going to be X, Y, Z. I never thought I was going to be a professor. <laughs> I let myself down. Anyway, the bottom line is this, is that our drive system is pushing. Go, 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 go. Execute. You can do it. This is going to be great. However, when we think about our drive system, we have to think about the flip side of this. How many of us are really driven but are terrified we're going to fail? Yeah. Yeah, so in the world of employees, yeah, I want to go get that new promotion. I really work really hard to get that, but what if I don't get the promotion? I told all my friends, everybody knows what's going to happen, okay? In the case of, like, my daughter, she just went out for the cheerleading squad, and it was terrifying. She didn't know if she was going to get on or not, and she got on, which is really amazing that's not very much like her, but I was very happy <laughs> and excited. The bottom line is she was stuck between these two systems, the drive and the threat system. I want to achieve, what happens if I don't achieve? Okay, the threat system is probably the most important system that we can talk about for a couple seconds. How many of you are terrified of being thrown out of a roller coaster car uh, because we're over here in your great America? <laughs> it's scary, right? But if you know you're safe, it's exciting. Life, though, doesn't give you rails, and it's chaotic, right? And our fear system is there to help keep us safe, right? So when we look at the world, we see the world, and we say, it's full of danger. How many of you are scared of flying? Of what? Of flying? Oh. Yeah. So I'm scared of flying. Don't tell anybody. This is on video. Uh, <laughs> I'm scared of flying. Why? Because humans aren't supposed to be 30,000 feet in the air. <laughs> um, but I also know that things are you know, over-engineered and there's huge amounts of safety redundancies in planes and there's no reason to be scared because it's more dangerous for me driving down here at Santa Clara than it is for me to get on a plane and fly to Moscow or you know, Thailand or something like that. The bottom line is that we see a plane crash one out of millions of flights annually and suddenly we become obsessed with this. Am I going to be the person that goes down, right? So our threat system exists for a good reason. It's to keep us safe. The interesting thing about this is that we really don't make the distinction between psychological threat and physical threat. Mm -hmm. And our bodies respond accordingly, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Let me for a second talk about your content, content system, your safety and your soothing system. Um, when you see primates, uh, like maybe monkeys, gorillas, orangutans, are they cute? Yeah. They can be kind of cute. They spend a lot of time doing what? Being lazy, <laughs> playing around. They fight, they do all the things that we do, but they do something that we don't see ourselves doing very frequently. They will pick the nits out of each other's fur, and they'll just kind of be next to each other, yeah, yeah, that's right. and just kind of close. Yeah. You know? And the cuddle. reality, yeah, they cuddle, right? They, they kind of, they find space to be close to each other. As humans, we're moving away from that, from that oftentimes, and it's still part of who we are. So we need to find a way to go ahead and activate the soothing system. There's a bunch of different ways we can do it. Um, you better say yes. Do you love your mom? 
Yes. <laughs> this is on video, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the bottom line is, is that your mom does what? Sometimes your mom tells you what's right. As a matter of fact, she probably tells you too frequently. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're all rolling your eyes. The bottom line is she also does what? Nurture. Does she nurture you? Yes. Does she give you kisses and hugs? Yes. And what happens when you are far away from home and you need somebody to talk to you and your shoulders are like this, you feel this burning in your head and you're just tense and you call your mom? What happens to you physiologically? You don't know what to say. Uh, just a little bit of a relaxation. Or maybe your best friend or maybe, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, etc., etc. Right? So we really want to think about this. This is having a physiological effect, and we need to go ahead and address this. We can do this in a large-scale circumstance as well. Um, there's whole systems for this where people make lots of money, right? Do you guys pay money to go see comedians? Yeah. Maybe not yet, but you will. <laughs> <laughs> the bottom line is, this, yeah, there are people who get paid to do this kind of work, right? Do we pay to get massages? Yeah. Do we pay to have people take care of us in special ways? I think so. So the reality is we do need to focus a little bit more on this. This is a quick overview of these three core systems. Um, scary news, though, folks. Uh, we seem to overstimulate the drive system. I hate to say this, but we are in a place that really overstimulates the drive system, right? What do we do? It's go, 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 go. It's be on top. It's be number one. It's be competitive. And there's nothing wrong with this, but if we're not addressing the needs of the soothing system, that's when problems might happen. I see this a lot in terms of whole societies. Let's stop for a second and think about how ideology impacts the well-being of whole generations, and you see this cross-culturally. I have a lot of colleagues and friends who come from a wonderful country, China. China had a one-child policy for a long time. Nothing wrong with that on the face of it. But if you do this for a couple generations, and then you have a burgeoning middle class and a lot of wealth, you start seeing kids having opportunities all over the place. There's nothing wrong with that either. It's a beautiful thing. However, when you have the expectations of multiple generations crushing down on an individual to be the best they can possibly be, suddenly that child suffers in a very significant way. Whether or not they have the money and the opportunities that are put in front of them, they're still normal human beings. Does that make sense? It doesn't matter how smart they are, but there could be challenges. So we do want to think about this, and we do want to understand that there can be a lot of overstimulation of the drive system. Um, we know that people with a strong threat and drive system seem to feel the need to prove themselves, right? How many degrees can you have? How many certifications can you have? How, where are you in terms of the ranking, the top of your class, et cetera, stuff like that, to constantly achieve. You know, it's interesting. We do this all the time. I sometimes feel the need to do this myself. It's not enough that I have a PhD. I'm going to be retrained in a different thing. You just see this chronically. I have so many friends who are on their second or third postdoc. I'm like, would you just stop? <laughs> be what you are. <laughs> it's OK. Um, we know that uh, the drive system is linked to status-seeking competitiveness and working to Avoid rejection. Rejection is part of life, folks. It's normal. It's not a bad thing, necessarily. All right, let me ask you some strange questions. Yes, it is true. I did work for the U.S. military. So when I do talk about killing people, I know what I'm talking about, at least from the psychological perspective. And to keep it fresh, <laughs> and not just talk about compassion, let me ask you, what's the best predictor of whether or not somebody else will take another person's life? Huh? It's a weird... Past history, maybe? It's a great response, but no. Yeah. <laughs> what else? Take a stab at it. Sorry, stab at it. Lack of talk. compassion. Maybe a lack of compassion? No? Nope. Yeah. The psychological well being. The psychological well being? You would think so, right? I mean, we always say, oh, these people are really messed up. It's not that. Yeah. One more, one more guess. No, no, they don't value your life. They don't value life? Okay, so you guys are all like right there, and I want to acknowledge every answer because, yeah, they're great answers. So back, way back in the day, uh, in about the 1900s, 1917 to be exact, um, something significant happened in the history of the United States. The United States entered World War I and sent a ton of soldiers to Germany, uh, where they fought against Germans in trench warfare. Um, the interesting thing about this, Germany and France, 
The interesting thing about this is that when the American soldiers got to the trenches, they weren't very far from the German soldiers. They're about as far as I am from maybe the end of this room. And they'd pick up their weapons and they'd look at the German soldiers. And what were they looking at? They were looking at young men who looked exactly like them. Mm -hmm. and they looked at them and they would aim their gun and they'd tilt their guns up and they'd shoot in the air. And the American military commanders found out about this. They're like, kill the enemy. And what they started to realize is that the closer you are to a human being, the more difficult it is to actually kill them. Not technically, but psychologically, when you recognize another's humanity, suddenly you're recognizing yourself in this person. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. So there's this intrinsic kind of relationship between us that we cannot stop. Mm -hmm. Now, we've done a great job of you know, putting those away by training our soldiers quite efficiently, but now what are we doing? We're dealing with about 20 people killing themselves on a daily basis mm -hmm. based on post-traumatic stress disorder. So we're good at training people to be killers, we're really bad at retraining them to enter society. Mm -hmm. So I bring this up because this compassion, this shared humanity is intrinsic to all of us. And it doesn't matter, uh, yes, there is significant problems in terms of racism, yes, there's significant problems in terms of the way that we classify each other. However, um, we are intrinsically based uh, in this kind of compassionate modality. So what is the best way to do it? Uh, this is why we've always used ranged weapons. How many of you have ever used a bow and arrow? A spear? Have you used a bow and arrow? Impressive. Uh, I just got shot by a bow and arrow once. That's another story. Um, we've used bow and arrows, spears, bullets. Now we use missiles. We use drones, right? So anything to keep us away from seeing the person that we're obliterating is the easiest way to kill somebody. When you're close to somebody, people don't use knives, people don't use bricks or sticks or stones, unless they're in places that don't have weapons. And incidentally, those are the places where you don't have such a vast murder rate like you do in the United States. So this is super pragmatic stuff. Yeah? What does a picture of the teeth have to do with that? Oh, uh, I'm so sorry. Thank you so much for, for asking. <laughs> I can't believe I neglected to share. So, uh, way back in the day, I worked for the Army Research Institute for Behavioral and Social Sciences, and I was doing some research on workplace violence. And I was going through the Bureau of Labor Statistics databases, and I came across this ridiculously bizarre statistic. Uh, the statistic was every 10 years, 6,000 people in the American workforce are bitten by their colleagues. This is not people who work in preschools, this is not people who are working with developmentally disabled uh, patients. This is, you know, Dan being so enraged at Galena that he jumps out of his cubicle and <laughs> bites her, right? Oh so the reason why that picture is up there, and thanks for asking, is because we are putting people under this inordinate amount of stress where they're doing things that really aren't quite natural. Does that make sense? That's right. So, excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Extra credit for asking. <laughs> That's fantastic. Okay, so we generally recognize that these things are not balanced. The real issue is that now that we understand a little bit of these systems, and there's a huge amount of literature on this, guys. I'm not going to force you to go through the whole rigmarole, but I'd be happy to give you some references. Regretfully, once we understand this, it really becomes our responsibility to understand how to balance them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So what we always say is, you know, if you were to have the opportunity to develop a human brain, you probably wouldn't have developed it the way that it's developed from an evolutionary perspective. But now that you understand it, it's your responsibility to work with it. Let me ask you a question. Nobody's going to see this. How many of you have ever been so angry that you can see yourself from above yourself? And you're telling yourself, don't do it, don't say that, and this red veil is kind of over your eyes. And you're watching yourself and you're saying, don't do it. And you do it anyways. Has that ever happened? If not, when you start dating, it will. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> the bottom line is this, is that we have to learn about our systems and say, okay, this isn't my fault. Now I understand it though, and I can do something about it. And that's where we have the opportunity to really make change in our environments. But it has to start with ourselves, right? Yeah. So this is usually what people's systems look like. You've got this giant threat system, you've got this medium-sized drive system, and then you've got this tiny pea-sized soothing system, which usually is labeled drugs. Mm. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But in fact, this is how people soothe themselves. When people are under such duress, when people are under so much pressure, what do they do yeah. to relieve themselves? Yeah, right. 
they just block it out. And one easy and quick way to do that is on every street corner in America. Right? Yeah. Okay. So let's move forward and we'll talk a tiny bit about my research. I don't want to bore you guys. This will be the most thrilling part of today's conversation. Just kidding. So let me just give you this is how brutal the world that we live in is. Um, who are the least important members of our society? It's people who don't make intellectual contributions from the perspective of the military. So since the 1970s, Congress has mandated that people have a certain amount of cognitive aptitude, intelligence. You know, you guys are thinking about the SAT, the ACT. That's a measure of intelligence, and it's a predictor of your performance in the first two years of school. After the first two years, it really drops out in terms of importance. But Congress said, hey, we don't want people who don't meet this criteria to join the military. But if you look at the military, it's ranked differentially. And I have got no problems with the military. As a matter of fact, I have a great deal of respect uh, having worked with the military. Not served, yes, I have short hair, but I never was in the military. Um, so the Navy is usually has the lowest cognitive aptitude uh, required. That's because these are the people who are storming the beaches. Um, and they're probably going to be mowed down first. Uh, second is the Army. Uh, third is the Navy, and then fourth is the most technological, right, the Air Force. Who knows what the Space Force will be? <laughs> so we'll talk about that more because I do some work in terms of uh, compassionate AI and empathetic AI. Um, it becomes really interesting because we can help people a lot, but at the same time, are we if the entities that people are communicating with aren't human? <laughs> Cool, awesome. And I'm, I'm goofing around. You guys are now family, so please, this is my silly sense of humor, uh, no offense. You'll be making more money than I uh, am right now in your sophomore year in college. Thank you, I appreciate that. Yeah, I actively work against people who are manipulators of people's uh, norms. But let's talk about that really quickly. I do teach people how to influence and use power, but not the dark side of the force. So again, you made a daring uh, you know, request for me to be here. Um, I'm interested in your careers for a bunch of different reasons, and I'm teasing all together. I try to get people's goats. You know this, right? Um, why did you choose those careers? What is it about those careers that interests you? It's funny, right? I didn't know what a psychologist was. I had no idea. Because my parents were blue collar people. They were just like, you go to work, go sweep. You learn a lot about detail orientation, <laughs> right? And I still am like, oh, I'm going to do something about that. Um, so why, did, why? What is it about careers? Is it because we're already intrinsically interested in a particular kind of interaction with other people? I would argue that, yeah, I mean, you have your personality already, right? And you're drawn to certain things. So when I started working in a business school, I started thinking, huh, why do people choose these careers? Not good, not bad, but it tied into some work that I'd already been doing. So I do a lot of work in terms of something called social dominance orientation. That's a, a nice, complex way of saying people who like to be on top. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So when we look at it, we can look at it from two different perspectives. There's going to be people who like being at the top, at the pinnacle of success, right? They're hierarchy enhancing people. They enhance society's pyramid, and there's people who are hierarchy attenuating. They like to create equitable situations that are flat where everybody has the same opportunity. Does this make sense to you guys? Okay. So the interesting thing, and this is why I've been studying SDO for a while, is because it relates back to my old areas of expertise, meaning racism, sexism, and ideology, in a sense. So the interesting thing about this is that we can look at this again from multiple perspectives. There's the traditional hierarchy enhancing behavior that relates to things like ethnocentrism and racism. And then there's also people who just want to be on top because they don't like equality. Does that make sense? So you can be a jerk either way. <laughs> it's up to you. <laughs> I'm teasing when I say that. Okay. So uh, the interesting thing is, is that people who score high on metrics, so the SDO, uh, tend to become members of institutions that maintain or decrease uh, hierarchy enhancing or attenuating behavior. So you could probably expect that psychologists are going to be hierarchy attenuating. They're gonna to try to keep things very equal. People in the humanities, people in the arts tend to want to seek equality. Uh, where do you see hierarchy enhancing behavior? Business consulting. <laughs> yeah, business <laughs> consulting for sure. Finance, economics, uh, medical, 
uh, mm -hmm. practitioners, actually lawyers back in the day when most of it wasn't done through AI, right? <laughs> so the reality of the situation is, is that when we move into these structures, we choose disciplines. I'm sorry? Yeah, sometimes the military as well, absolutely, because it gives you clear indications as where to go. Life isn't based on ladders, right? I mean, the interesting thing about going through school is that you always have a next class to take. Mm -hmm. It's not that way in reality. Any of us can tell you <laughs> that. Um, so the interesting thing is that people have a tendency to move towards what fits them best, and interestingly enough, they're surrounded by people who feel the same way. Right? So you go to school, you're surrounded by people who believe the same things you do, then you get out of school and you move into organizations that also do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So nothing wrong about this, but I'll share with you some of the things that have uh, consequences of this kind of interaction. Um, I'm very interested in people's psychological well-being as well, so I've created uh, a bunch of studies where we found links between high levels of social dominance orientation and things like low levels of compassion for others. Well, this really shouldn't shock you. If you've ever talked to an old school economist, they don't see human beings as anything besides human capital and maybe productivity. So they're not interested in whether or not somebody's parents is passing away. They need them to finish a project at a certain period in time. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Okay. And again, I'm not disparaging economists in any way, shape, or form. Um, the sad reality is that we also find high levels of SDO associated with increased levels of fear of compassion. Now, this is always an awkward thing to say, but have you ever been worried about offering compassion to another person? Maybe they're going to take advantage of you, mm -hmm. or maybe they're going to abuse your kindness. Yeah. Have you ever felt worried about receiving compassion from others? Maybe it would make you feel weak, like you're not strong enough to take care of yourself. Yeah. Or they're not genuine. I'm sorry? Oh, or they're not genuine. Or maybe they're just not being genuine. Yeah, there's all these wonderful, benevolent, domineering types who will say, let me take care of you. You obviously can't take care of yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Be that as it may, the reality of the situation is this men in every culture, across every historical era, have been taught not to accept help because that just expresses their weakness. Mm -hmm. What's the first thing you teach boys? be strong, to be tough, and not to need any assistance in any way, shape, or form. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting we can talk about that in terms of suicidology. I'm not going to today, but let's move forward and talk about the real ramifications of high levels of social dominance orientation and depression. These are people who are isolated from other people. Um, they don't want to be engaged with other people because that would diminish their own importance. Um, these people are more anxious. What if they lose their place on top of a hierarchy and they're stressed out because they know they constantly have to achieve, all right? The funny thing about this is that when we look at this in terms of people's adherence to free market ideology, you guys have probably heard about this at the stage, uh, it exacerbates these relationships. It's like pouring gasoline on a fire, okay? So we have a system that supports this kind of engagement we tell people that, hey, anybody can make it. Is that the truth? No. <laughs> we live in a super racist and inequitable society where, sadly, we don't all start from the same place. However, we train people in this wonderful myth called the American Dream where we say, hey, anybody can make it. And if you fail, it's not on us, it's on you, right? So we really want to be aware of this. All right, you can look up some of these cool uh, pieces of research. Boring if you ever run out of sleeping medication. Feel free to read one of mine. <laughs> Be bored out of your mind. The neat thing is that we've also looked at the mediational role of compassion on leadership. And this is really interesting because very few people have taken the, a broader perspective on looking at leadership. So we're really interested in how people connect with followers. I think it's kind of funny, over the course of your career, you guys take leadership courses. Part of me thinks that's the dumbest thing in the world. Why? How many of us are ever leaders in our lives? Very infrequently in all of our roles, right? So we should be taking followership classes as well as leadership <laughs> classes, right? I know it sounds counterintuitive, but. So the interesting thing is, when we look at positive leadership, it's oftentimes negatively correlated with social dominance orientation. No surprise there. 
people who are high SDO tend to take a really kind of authoritative, I should say, authoritarian leadership style, where their goal is to drive people down and force them to do certain things. Mm -hmm. uh, we find that good leaders are related to compassionate approaches, and when we start thinking about this, we should be training leaders to understand a little bit more about their followers so they can get the most out of them. Uh, it may not be the most immediate thing, but how many of you have had somebody yell at you until you just stopped working? You know, mom, dad. No, I'm kidding. All right. um, or your boss, or whatever the case may be. The reality of the situation is, is at a certain point, we just shut down. And That's we don't right. work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we need to start thinking about this in a better and more interesting perspective. All right. So let's talk a little bit about lost compassion because it's not enough to tell people, be nice to people in your shop. Because that just doesn't work. Like, what the hell does that mean? Excuse my language. <laughs> right? So when we think about extending or receiving compassion, we're worried oftentimes that others might take advantage of us if we're being generous with our compassion to others. We might think that if we receive it from others, the manipulation might happen as we talked about before. And many times we fear that we're being overindulgent when we actually are giving ourselves a break uh, to catch up, to recharge, right? So this is from some work that I did a couple of years ago, and I want to just point out some interesting relationships. Uh, correlation is just the link between one number and another number, but in the behavioral and social sciences, it's very rare that you see super significant and highly correlated uh, kinds of results like this. So this is from a population of students from Cal State East Bay, where I'm a professor, a tenured faculty member. Um, you see that when people are fearful of giving compassion to others, they have high levels of stress, significant levels of stress, significant levels of anxiety, significant levels of depression. However, when we look at people's capacity to receive compassion from others and compassion for themselves, suddenly these significant correlations leap up. Mm -hmm. And this just tells you the very things that we need most are the things that we're pushing away when we stop receiving compassion, mm -hmm. when we stop being willing to offer it to others and ourselves. So I want you to think about how vicious we are to ourselves. For two seconds, think about the verbal conversation you have in your mind with yourself mm -hmm. on a nightly basis when you go to bed. Would you ever talk to anybody like would you ever call somebody the names you call yourself? Mm -hmm. Would you ever berate somebody the way you do yourself? I think we all know, and I feel comfortable saying this because I work with thousands and thousands of people, and also this is what the research tells us, and I do the same thing when I go to sleep every night. The rumination kicks in, and suddenly I'm thinking, I could have done a better job mm -hmm. uh, working with Goodler this afternoon. I could have, I should have bought this, I should have. Miss the opportunity to talk about the teeth. Thank goodness that student was here, right? <laughs> so the reality is, is, if I didn't know this stuff, the teeth would be replaying in my mind over and over. I'm a failure. I'm supposed to have a doctorate. How can I do that, right? No, I'm totally bad. Anyways, <laughs> uh, what we want to do is we want to really start thinking about comprehensive psychology of engagement. What does this mean? We want to start thinking about how we can be compassionate uh, towards others, um, receiving it from others to ourselves. And then saying, hey, I'm lonely, I'm scared, and in this circumstance there's nobody to help me. How can I hold my own hand through this? Have you ever been able to do that? Mm -hmm. It's a tough thing, and it sounds silly, and it sounds maybe simple, uh, too simple. But the reality is, is you are your best friend, and we really want you to be in a position where you're able to say, okay, I understand that I'm really struggling at this moment in time. And I also want you to start thinking about this really important person who you know but you haven't met yet. This is really weird. And no, I'm not on drugs. I want you to start thinking about your future self. Your future self is totally successful, right? They're a programmer. They're an admiral in the Navy. Uh, they're doing great stuff in terms of fashion marketing, right? You can see that. You know who they are. You know what they've done. All you need to do is ask them for some assistance because they're already there. It's just they're in the future. Mm -hmm. Again, slightly strange concept, but we'll come back to it a little bit later, okay? So, um, these are important things. Let's go ahead and move into our first exercise, and as usual, I am so long-winded, don't hesitate to tell me to speed up. So, um, how many of you are familiar with empathic active listening? Okay, do you guys have friends? Yeah. Oh, really? Cool, so you're not American? <laughs> <laughs> the reality of the situation is Americans are exceptionally lonely people, yeah. uh, and you know, we're finding this is something that's becoming an endemic uh, epidemic. 
uh, across the world. Um, so what I'd like you to do is think about a terrible question again. Which grandma do you love the most? Is it your mom's or your dad's? Don't say anything. Just imagine it in your mind. You know the grandma you love the most. It's the one that listens to you. It's not the one who makes you the best food or buys you the best presents. It's the grandma who's there for you. Just, she hears you, she looks at you, she's, she's caressing your soul. Could be your grandpa, could be a friend, could be your dog, <laughs> could be your cat, right? Uh, so the reality is, is we want to extend that kind of opportunity to everybody in this room in terms of listening, in terms of paying close attention. How many of you are good at eye contact when it's comfortable? You don't want to look at somebody so much that they feel uncomfortable? Like awkward, <laughs> like when you're on the bus and somebody starts staring at you and you're all... <laughs> so, reality of the situation is we want to be good active listeners. We want to hear when somebody's talking to us, when somebody says something, we want to respond empathically through facial gestures. Our facial uh, expression is pretty much the same across most cultures. Yeah, for the most part. There's some interesting new research about that. We don't need to go into that. The bottom line is I'd like for you to think about, before we go into any kind of listening experience, what your top three values are. What are the things that are most important to you in life? They don't have to be on this, but it's the things that you want most. What's the most important thing for you? What value is most important to you? So top three, in order. But you don't need to say anything quite yet because you're going to be sharing it with another colleague. So I'm glad that you already know about it. Yeah. I know right away. Perfect. Okay, you guys just kind of nod your head when you, when you know what they are. Yeah? Yeah? No rush or anything like that. This is an interesting question because oftentimes we're not thinking about our values. Let's do this. What I want you to do is I want you to find another person. And the thing is, you guys know each other because you've been here uh, for the weekend and talked to each other. But what I'd like you to do is find somebody that maybe you haven't had a chance to chat with. And I want you to share a recent experience where you felt like you were functioning at your best, acting in accordance with your number one most important value. So maybe it was humor you had an opportunity to cheer somebody up who was not feeling so well. Uh, you made them laugh. Um, it's it's got to be behavioral, right? So the reality is, is values are important, but oftentimes they don't interfere, interfere with what we do on a daily basis. I'm asking you, what was a time when you were acting, when you were behaving, when your behavior was consistent with that value? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so why don't you do this? Why don't you take a couple minutes and find somebody you haven't had a chance to chat with today and talk about a time, and this could be at school, obviously, it doesn't have to be at work, uh, where you function at your best, acting in accordance with your chosen number one value. Go ahead. Can you go back to Bobby Fulch? Yeah, sure. Go back. Don't so watch. There's been no moment today that's been more impactful than this. <laughs> yeah. I'm just kidding. I always make up strange things to say after this. But yeah, definitely thank your colleague. It's something that you need to get used to. So there's a couple things that are really important about this. Um, look, I care about compassion. I care about my fellow man and woman and humanity. But I now am going to leave here after you know thanking you guys for a wonderful time and feeling this warmth in my heart. I'm going to drive onto the street and I'm going to start flipping people off as they get in front of me on the freeway going home. Uh, that's not living in congruence with my values. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So there's the behavior that would be congruent, which is me saying, you know, that person might be rushing a pregnant woman to the hospital because right. she's in labor. Mm -hmm. Or maybe that person needs to be somewhere that's more important than where I'm going. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So living in congruence is being in a circumstance where your values are clear and on a daily basis you are able to pursue them. So it's really interesting. <clears throat> when I started working with Stanford, uh, I'd be doing these presentations in front of these large groups of people, and inevitably at the end of these presentations, there'd be a bunch of men kind of milling around in the back of the room. And I'd be waiting for them to come and talk to me, but they were all looking at each other, waiting for another person to leave so they could be the only person who could talk to me. Have you ever had this weird yeah. kind of situation? So inevitably, they'd finally come up to me and they'd be all, you're describing me. How do, I, how do I get rid of this feeling that I've crushed a million people getting to where I am? 
And I'm like, well, you know, you could do a lot of different things to feel that way. But one of the first things anybody can do as they're moving towards their career is really understand their values. Because if you're able to do what feels right for you on a daily basis, then you're not going to suffer when you come home and say, I hate this job. I'm stuck because I make too much money now right. and I just want to leave it. So understanding your values becomes this really important component of living a, a, a very successful life. When we say success, we're not defining it in terms of the way society defines it because society defines it in a way that's very easily quantified, which is this. But if you can't live with yourself and if you're suffering and you start to do all kinds of things that are not good for you, um, then it doesn't really matter how much you're worth, right? So these things become important. I'm not suggesting that money isn't important. What I'm suggesting is, is you really want to live out the values of congruent life so you can avoid things like rumination, where we were talking about going to sleep and having those weird uh, kind of visions of what you maybe didn't do with the, the best of your capacity, and understanding that stress and burnout really lead to a short uh, kind of engagement at work and in society. So tell me, give me one of the examples of uh, a situation where you were living and working and behaving in a values congruent fashion. So I'll give you an example from uh, my my eighth grader's reality. She's she's so funny. She's and she's gonna watch this video at some point in time. She'll be like, oh my gosh. Um, she rolls her eyes. You guys roll your eyes at your parents. It's natural. <laughs> Not when they're looking, right? Okay, there we go. Yeah. So the bottom line. <laughs> so they just like, oh whatever. You and your psychology research is totally lame. You're right, right? Um, but a couple weeks ago, I think this is a month or so ago. Um, one of my daughters was following her friend on Snap. I didn't even know what that was. No, I did. Okay. She was following her friend on Snapchat, and she thought for some reason she was having a really terrible time. She was worried, like, is she going to hurt herself? And it became this really scary thing. And suddenly my daughter called me. She's like, hey, Dad, what do I do in this circumstance? I'm like, here are some resources that you can potentially use. And she's like, yeah. Immediately she wrote her back and was like, yeah, you know, if you're really worried about anything, you can feel free to talk to me. But if you really need to talk to somebody, uh, more experience and expertise in this, then you should call this phone number or you, know, you can reach out via this text line or whatever the case may be. And she was so proud of herself and I was thrilled for her. Her friend was fine, it was not a problem. She was maybe overreacting. But at the same time, she was living in congruence with her desire to help her friend. And friends are really important to my daughter, as they, friends tend to be when you're moving through your adolescence, right? Uh, and being an adult. So think about that. Think about when you feel good. And then also think about when you feel bad. Is it potentially that because you're not behaving in a way that's consistent with what you value the most? This is what I just want you guys to start peeling back. Because many of us move through our lives doing what's right, not for us, but for other people. Does that make sense? That's right. Yeah. So I know so many students whose parents are like, become an accountant. <laughs> become, uh, you know, X, Y, and Z. I have so many friends who are entrepreneurs who are medical doctors who have never practiced medicine because their parents said, you're going to become a doctor, and that's all to it. Mm -hmm. And they just didn't want to do that. They wanted to become a guitarist <laughs> or something else. Brilliant people, just not expressing their values. Does that make sense? Okay, so we want you to know. We want you to start understanding a little bit more about this stuff, right? There's introversion, extroversion, neither good nor bad. I think one thing that, that's really important is that we're really sensitive to judgment, aren't we? And I don't say this in particular for people from eighth grade on, I say this for adults. Uh, I mean, I know I'm the world's most petty person. You say something negative about me, I'll remember it for years, you know? And I'll see you and I'll be like, oh, no, I hate that person. Oh, hi, how are you? <laughs> yeah, I'm good. Anyways, I'm kidding, I'm working on it. <laughs> but the long and short of it is, is that we're predisposed to be this way. And sometimes we're so good at being aware that people are gonna judge us that we just don't even share. So there's nothing wrong with, with being independent, that's for sure, right? Um, the interesting thing is, how many times have you learned something from somebody that they shared with you that was when they were most vulnerable? Has that ever happened? Yeah. So it's not to suggest that there's a right or a wrong, but the interesting thing is, is that when we share with each other, it's almost like this environment, right? I'm sure one of the first things that you guys talked about being here is that there's no wrong answer. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong that you could say because we develop, we build from different things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when, uh, when, my, when my friends found out that I was a psychologist, you know, you guys would go to like one of these 20th year reunions. People were like, oh, oh, wow, I thought you'd be dead by now. You were that guy who dropped out of high school, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> 
So it's neither good nor bad, but I encourage you to say, you know, hey, I, when I want to be by myself, be by yourself. That's totally awesome. Um, and at the same time, you're a strong person and you have a great deal of fortitude. And the thing is, is that people will take pot shots at you all the time. And that's just part of life in reality. And you can just be like, oh, okay, cool. That's your perspective. I'm, I'm going to keep on moving. Does that make sense? And it, it doesn't mean we have to buy into their perspective because they could be right at that moment, but it certainly doesn't mean they're right the next day or six months from then or 10 years from then. So you're always growing. You're always changing. I'm going to do what's right for you at this one moment. Yeah. But it's interesting because we are so sensitive because we have to realize and we have to recognize that you know, oftentimes we do things that run contrary to our values and that might lead us to do illegal things. And there's tons of wonderful, amazing people that we hold up as heroes who did illegal things, like Mahatma Gandhi or MLK. Their actions were illegal at that time. It doesn't mean that the laws that were justified. Yeah. <laughs> so we do need to focus on our values. I think that's wonderful. And speaking of families and holding them up, so will you adopt me? Okay. Well, yeah. Well, <laughs> so, you know, you guys are too young to remember this person I'm going to talk about. But the interesting thing is, is you know, our drive cycle, remember our ambition cycle, oftentimes it takes us directly into our fear and threat circle. Yeah? Has there been a circumstance like this? Like when you're studying for finals? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's an underrepresented philosopher of the late 20th century that I hold uh, in great esteem that most people don't know as a philosopher. But you guys might not recognize this person, but you might, and if you don't, you watch YouTube videos of some of his greatest statements. It was Mike Tyson. Mm. He's a very famous boxer. And what he said really resonated with me in terms of reality, which is everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. That's right. <laughs> and it's, 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 it's such a concise and brilliant way of saying, you can do whatever you want to do, but life is going to punch you in the face. Mm. <laughs> so the question isn't whether or not life is going to punch you in the face, it's how do we become more resilient so we can get up that much more quickly. Does that make sense? Okay. If we know that this is going to happen to us, how do we prepare ourselves for the inevitable? All of us are going to move through our lives. All of us are going to have physical ailments. All of us are going to get sick. All of us are going to have trouble with our relationships. All of us are going to have all of these wonderful things that occur throughout our lives. So I just want us to remember that we're all going to be moving on this kind of wave-like pattern in terms of our emotions, in terms of being uh, in a good place and a bad place. And, and there's never anything wrong with it. It's just we need to start building resiliency. So it feels good, doesn't it? Like, ah, yeah, I did something wonderful today. Um, that's awesome. But the question becomes, huh, how do we take all this brilliant work and start moving into a much broader paradigm? How do we say, cool, uh, I know I can help people, but I can't be everywhere at one place, at one time. Um, we have clinical psychologists who can do this kind of work, um, but can they be everywhere at one time? Can they serve everyone? Can they speak every language? Not really, right? So my question has always been, cool, how do we take research and translate it into something that's meaningful for everybody in a distributed fashion? And how do we measure impact as well? So um, for me, that actually stems from some work that actually happened in Moscow at one point in time. I was reading this book. You guys ever heard of something called social capital? Mm -hmm. Okay, so social capital really simply is how we interact with each other. Now I'm going to ask you some questions that may not be relevant for the younger folks in the audience, but um, have you gone on trips for school or something like that? Like a field trip or like a study abroad type of deal? Okay, so you sit down next to this person and you're like, this person's a creep, what am I supposed to do? Then you say, hey, what's up? <laughs> and then they say, I don't know, it's weird weather, and you're like, yeah, it is. And then you start talking, and then suddenly you have this really deep conversation. Has that ever happened? Mm -hmm. Isn't this how we meet our friends? Yeah. You're just like, hey, where's the bus? <laughs> <laughs> and then from there, you have a best friend for the rest of your life. Well, the reality of the situation is we are good at communicating with each other, but we're not good at channeling social capital. Social capital is really just our perspective on other people's trustworthiness and reciprocity between them. Now, you're gonna give gifts maybe later on this year for one reason or another, or maybe you've already given gifts or there's gonna be something like this. The bottom line is, is that we as humans, if you come to my house, what are you gonna bring? 
you're gonna bring some food, you're gonna bring something to drink, like Gatorade or whatever. Um, and then you invite me to your house, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna bring something back, right? Uh, if you need me, I'm gonna be there for you. But if I need you, are you gonna be there for me? This is social capital, this is friendship, right? So it's interesting when we think about this, social capital is really who knows who, your social network, it's the strength of your ties. And there's two different approaches that we can take in this. There's weak social capital, which is people you're friends with, but you're not really emotionally tied to. And there's strong ties, which is emotional, deep emotional connections, boyfriends, girlfriends, husbands, wives, brothers, sisters, this kind of stuff. But the interesting thing is we know that we can develop this by repeated exposure and shared spaces. You guys are gonna be with your cohort for a, a good while. You're gonna be honest with each other, I believe, in this kind of environment. You're gonna follow through on your commitments. You're gonna be taking care of all the things, the patients, of uh, this uh, Goodler uh, start approach. And you're gonna be consistent in your behavior. Do you look for consistency in your friend's behavior? Yeah, yeah of course, okay. So the thing is, is, we know we can develop uh, social capital. And you know, I have a feeling that everybody in this room is sufficiently brilliant that we could probably solve all the world's problems if we just gave appropriate channels for the social capital, if that makes sense. So how do we use social capital to facilitate well-being and compassion. Oh, I forgot I'm doing it this way now. So I told you I was a sellout, right? I'm a business professor, and I happen to be a business professor <coughs> in organizational behavior and human resources management and management. The thing is, is my colleagues and the people that I work with really don't care unless they see some sort of value associated with this kind of work. So I started thinking, huh, you know, I can tell people the world needs to be a more compassionate place. They'll be like, well, yeah, well, what's the bottom line in terms of money, right? So I started thinking about this, and because I've also worked with the U.S. government, I do a lot of consulting in these types of areas, I started thinking about the competencies that people need, right? And here's the reality of the situation, and we know this from a host of different uh, approaches, is that technical skills will always be things that you can develop, right? Um, and we know that technology is changing so dramatically and so rapidly right now that what you graduate with isn't what you're going to be using by the time you're my age, early 20s. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, that would be a joke. <laughs> the bottom line is, is that the things that won't change are your are interpersonal skills, right? Yes, so these are things like conflict resolution, interpersonal skills, negotiation, customer service, and emotional intelligence. Well, the reality of the situation is these are the exact things that we're developing in terms of using our compassion-based approaches. Um, we know that people are able to facilitate extraordinary performance by virtue of a wide array of positive communication approaches and relationships. We know that people are not innovative or creative when they're stressed out. Mm -hmm. What's our main export here in the Silicon Valley? Creativity and innovation. Mm -hmm. He tells me, just be creative. Yeah. I'm gonna fire you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, <I'm> gonna fire. <laughs> right. it, it doesn't work that way, right. right? You have to give people a safe environment where they feel really comfortable and they're making connections and they're not worried about saying things that may be perceived as silly. You know, I used to, just, just a quick one, I used to have a job where would say, here's two hours and, and go and create stuff, like stare out of the window and create something. <laughs> that was really, really in, like great environment for me. <laughs> in two hours, I have to come up with something. <laughs> it's, it's funny because on one hand, it's awesome in the sense that you have that freedom, but then there's the ticking clock, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, 30 seconds have gone by and I haven't created it's like, I don't want to do anything. Just stare out of the window and be creative. That's all. <laughs> That's funny. Um, the interesting thing is, is, it's also important for the things that we say are so important in Silicon Valley, like engagement or psychological capital. This is people's desire to work together uh, effectively and to be excited about the work that they're actually doing. So let's zip you through and move on to, I'm forgetting, uh, what, we, what we decided to do with this. Um, so a while back, I was developing, so it was really interesting. You guys know the CSU system, right? How many of you are thinking about going to the CSU system? Your parents would be so upset if you actually said that. Uh, UC, Stanford, Santa Clara, these are the, or, you know, whatever. There's all kinds of good schools. The bottom line is the CSU system is an excellent school system. We serve people who are more like I was when I was growing up. I came from a working class family. I was the first student in my family to go to school. And I didn't have enough money to go, right? So one out of every 10 students in the CSU system is homeless. Homeless out of 480,000 people. Wow. Yeah. 
um, it is the largest public institution of higher education in the United States. Mm. There's 23 campuses throughout California. Mm. So it's the middle section. So there's the UC system, which is the research institution. There's the CSU system, which is the training. Mm. And then there's the, C uh, the com community college system, which is to get you into those two systems. Mm. Um, one out of every five of our students is food insufficient. They don't know where they're gonna get their food that night. Wow. Um, so when I was pulled over to Stanford, uh, this was during a sabbatical of mine, I met the students at Stanford, and they all were doing great. They're all very stressed out, though, incidentally. Have you ever heard of something called the Stanford Duck? You've heard of this? What's the Stanford Duck? I've heard of it, but I'm not exactly sure what it is. Like. No problem. What does a duck look like on a pond? It looks beautiful and placid and just moving beautifully through the water. What you don't see is its feet going like this <laughs> underneath. And that's the Stanford student. You look at them and you're like, oh, everything is so beautiful and easy for them, but they're struggling <laughs> mightily to keep up with things. Anyways, my students, um, if a Stanford student starts having problems, they have this beautiful endowment. Oh my gosh, I'm doing terrible in this class. I'm getting an A minus. Well, they'll get two yeah. postdocs to help them, a dietitian, a chiropractor, <laughs> an acupuncturist, and before you know anything is done, they'll be back to their normal A plus. If one of my students has any problems, they drop out of school and they're gone forever. And that's all there is. So when I started working for Stanford, um, it was really interesting. They were doing some compassion development classes. And guess who were going? People who could afford to be at Stanford on a Friday afternoon staring at a wall, which I have no problem with, uh, for four hours. Um, but when I looked at the people who were going there, they didn't represent the people I work with, nor the future of California. And when we talk about educational inequality, it becomes really important because educational quality has everything to do with equality in society and your ability to move through different socioeconomic mm -hmm. classes. I'll recommend a couple of books on this that'll freak you out. Uh, and they're good and they're written for the layperson and you guys are smart enough to be able to tackle this stuff. The bottom line is I started thinking, huh, how can we address this? Well, I've already been working on large scale mentoring programs. And the reason why is because as an industrial organizational psychologist, I know a lot about the science of mentoring. And it was really weird. When I went out there, I would look around and I'd see all kinds of mentoring packages that weren't based on science. They would just put people together and be like, I'll help each other. Ridiculous. Um, but then, you know, you look at reality and you can see that there are dating websites that purport to match people uh, for lifelong relationships. Ridiculous, not very valid. And I'll tell you about the work that I've done with one of them uh, a little bit later. But the bottom line is I started thinking, huh, how can I bring compassion to my students? How can I bring compassion to people who don't have the time to go to Stanford, who can't afford to go to Stanford? So I started chatting with some of my friends. And within a couple of weeks, we put together something called the Compassion Skills Training. It's an eight week class. And what happens is that people read a very brief introduction written for the layperson. Uh, very simplified scientific literature, cutting edge research on compassion. And I'll walk you through that in a second. Um, how effective is this? I'm sorry, my middle school friend, how old are you? Oh, uh, 13. Okay, so when my daughter was 13, she actually did this program with a 50 year old medical doctor. Mm. Uh, but we'll talk about that in a second. So it's an eight week peer to peer course. What does that mean? It means it's dyadic. What were you just doing? You were working in dyads, right? You were talking with one other person. When you think about it, social engagement is much easier for us than things like meditation. Have you ever tried to meditate? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is it really hard? It's like a chore. <laughs> <laughs> so I have nothing wrong with meditation. And the research is really clear on the benefits that meditation brings. But it's ridiculous. We're built to socialize. We're built to interact with each other. We're not built to interact with ourselves. How many of you think you're better looking than you actually are? How many of you think you're worse looking than you are? It just depends on the day, right? <laughs> um, how many you think you're taller than you are, shorter than you are, fatter, skinnier, etc., etc., right? So when we look at ourselves, we're terrible. There's so many biases that come into place that we're just really awful at introspection, right? But when you have a conversation with a friend and they serve as a social mirror, whoa, you can get some great insights. Have you ever been sitting down with a friend and they share something with you? You're like, oh my gosh, I couldn't see it until somebody shared it with me. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this dyadic kind of interaction speeds what you can get from meditation quite rapidly. Um, once people are finished reading the brief content, they go into a video chat. The video chat is just like, well, what kind of video chat do you use? Mm -hmm. You use like WhatsApp? Do you use Skype? Do you use, what do you use? Messenger video call. 
Messenger video call? Okay, cool. WeChat? Have you guys any friends in China? Okay. They made Instagram into like a FaceTime now. So oh, is it really? Know. Okay. Insta. Yeah, of course I know. What's that? Oh. Yeah, I use WhatsApp. So the bottom line is you're familiar with that. And the interesting thing about this is it serves a couple different purposes. One, people can see each other's emotional response. Mm -hmm. Two, they're able to see themselves, so it meets our narcissistic needs to be yeah. in the picture ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> and three, it's psychologically distant enough that we feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. But we can still look somebody in the eyes. How many of you feel weird looking at somebody in the eyes? You know, like you sit down with somebody and you're like, oh. <laughs> 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 yeah. So this is a problem that many people have. It's not based on age. Yeah. Uh, it's based on engineering. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> There's some interesting things to talk about. Anyways, the bottom line is this, is that you won't have any problems. Um, the interesting thing about this is before people even dive into this, we go ahead and collect psychometric data from people. What is psychometrics? Psychometrics are the predictive models we use to understand people's behavior. So when we talk about self-esteem, depression, anxiety, leadership, service orientation, managerial potential, it doesn't matter if it's occupational or well-being. We have metrics for these things, and they actually predict human behavior. Mm -hmm. They're not algorithms, because algorithms do a great job of also being racist inadvertently. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, they do things we don't want them to do. Psychologists have spent a lot of time linking the responses from these psychometric tools to actual behavior, so we can predict what people are going to do. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Is it perfect? No. Is it better than most things? It's legally sufficient to hire people based on whatever the requirements for the job are. Okay, so that's the question. Once people are finished, we collect more psychometric data, pre-test, post-test. We also collect outcomes, and this serves a couple different purposes, and I'll show you them really quickly. Um, because we want to know how people feel. How, if I asked you, where do you feel stress right now, where would you say? What's that? In your body, I'm sorry. Yeah. In your head? Somebody Burning, maybe your shoulders? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Shoulders. Neck. Neck. Okay, great. So you guys are already self aware. When I started doing this research, I was all, uh, I don't know, is that coffee? <laughs> is it just, you know, I, I wasn't really sure, to be honest with you, because I didn't know how it would manifest itself. So we give people the opportunity to understand what might be happening and then just to express it. Mm -hmm. This is great because it gives us information that we can use for marketing purposes, so we can use for things like customer outcomes we can use for things like corporate social responsibility. There's a wide array of ways that we can use this stuff. So once people go through the first one, they progress into the next session and kaboom, hear what the sessions are. And the sessions are really interesting in the sense that they start off just how you did today. They go into active listening and they think about role models in terms of leadership. And here's the thing about sessions. Psychologists are really dumb people and they're also really smart. Oftentimes we talk about these really broad constructs. But the thing is, is we take these constructs from research and we say, hey, what is this concept? Hey, who do you know that exhibits these things? Hey, what does it look like behaviorally? How do you know that this person is being a leader? What behavior? Don't just tell me they're a leader. Tell me how behaviorally they do. Is it through communication? Is it through some action that they take? How does it make you feel? What would it be like if you started using some of these behaviors and how can you apply that over the course of the following week? And then the next time you meet, what's the first question you ask? How did things go last week when you started talking to that guy about his backpack because he thought he was cute? Mm -hmm. Sorry, that's my dog. <laughs> I'm like, you gotta get a better opening line than that. Yeah. Anyways, so they do this every week. The first week they talk about active listening. They're not actually talking about it. They're using leadership to learn about active listening. They move into mindfulness and core values. So they go through an experience just like the one that you did. They then talk about the evolutionary neuroscience of emotions, the three like, circle model we talked about. They go into growth mindsets and compassionate thinking. You guys are probably familiar with uh, fixed thinking and growth uh, thinking, growth mindsets. Uh, then they move into, notice we really haven't talked too much about compassion. You need to build people's strength before you start moving towards suffering. Uh, then we move into receiving help uh, and self-compassion. We spend two whole sessions talking about self-compassion the reason why is because it's so foreign to people. Um, we've been trained our whole life just to give, 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 give. And the good news about this is that people have a lot of growth. The bad news is we do a lot of this work with doctors and nurses. And nurses in particular have really strong reaction toward this. And we've had some nurses say, hey, thanks so much for this class. This is the best thing I've ever done. And I'm quitting my 30-year career of being a nurse because I just realized I never took care of anybody besides everyone else. 
I'm never taking care of myself. And this is really devastating when you find out that, oh my gosh, like I've abused myself thoroughly over the course of the years because I never took care of myself. And if you think about it for two seconds, hey Josie, that's my girlfriend. My girlfriend is a flight attendant. She used to be an accountant. And the first thing the flight attendant tells you is what we're talking about when we talk about self-compassion, which is? Take care of others. That's close. But what do they really tell you? When the oxygen bag comes down, oh, do put it on yourself. Mm -hmm. And if yours isn't working, take it from the child next to you. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> they say, put it on yourself and then put it on the child. And the reason why is you're not going to be helped to anybody if you're dead. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's like being a nurse or a professor or you know somebody who's doing wonderful things for a million different communities. If you don't take care of yourself, no one's going to benefit because you won't be there, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to take care of ourselves to facilitate strength in others. But if no one's taking care of us, and of course, even if people are taking care of us, we have to take care of ourselves. That's right. Yeah. So this is what self-compassion applied skills is. Then we move into emotional intelligence and extending compassion to others. Um, and then finally, we consolidate this program. Eight weeks, it's about 16 hours. Who's done this program? Well, there's been people uh, who, from, from middle school into high school, uh, we've had college students, we've had graduate students. They've been ranging from psychology to business to a wide array of other things. We've had doctors, we've had nurses, we've had CEOs, we've had people in HR. We've had people in technology go through this too. Technology people are hysterical. <laughs> There's something inside of me I did not know of. <laughs> it's called an emotion. <laughs> just kidding. Anyways, the, the bottom line is we move into our life description. So can I jump on mine real quick? Mm -hmm. Sure. <sighs> Students are matched with people based on a really interesting psychometric.